This lecture is part of an online course on the theory of numbers and will be about the Chinese remainder theorem. So as motivation for this, suppose we look at the following problem. Let's try and solve some polynomial f of x is congruent to 0 modulo m. So for example, we might want to try and solve, say, x cubed is congruent to 5 modulo 60. And um, we can sort of solve this in three steps. First of all, it's easier if m is prime. Um, the reason for this is that the integers modulo m form a field um, so, the, in other words, the non-zero integers modulo m have inverses, which makes life a lot easier. Um, secondly, the case when m is a prime power can be reduced, well, it can quite often be reduced to the case where m is a prime. Um, I might talk about this a bit in a later lecture. Um, thirdly, the Chinese remainder theorem reduces the case of any m to the case when m is a prime power. So, um, so the general technique for solving a congruence modulo some number is we're first going to use the Chinese remainder theorem to reduce the case of prime powers. Then we reduce the case of prime powers to primes using things like Hensel's lemma. And then we solve for the case when m is prime by using the fact that the integers modulo a prime are particularly well behaved. So um, before going on, I just want to introduce some standard notation. So we generally write z modulo mz for the integers modulo m. So it would be the integers represented by 0, 1 up to m minus 1. Um, and this is a ring, meaning you can do addition and multiplication on these and it satisfies many of the usual properties. We're also going to use the notation z over mz uh, times to be the group of integers modulo m that are co-prime to m under multiplication and, and, and we're thinking of them as being a group under multiplication. So you remember we checked that the integers co-prime to m were closed under multiplication and have inverses and so on. And um, it turns out to be one thing you need to use a lot is what does this, how does this group behave like? And one major application of the Chinese remainder theorem will be to try and understand the structure of this group, as we'll see later. Um, anyway, um, suppose we want to solve the equation f of x is congruent to 0 modulo mn. Well, suppose we found a solution then we can certainly solve this, the equation f of x is congruent to 0 modulo m because we can just use the same value of x and we can also solve the equation f of x is congruent to 0 modulo n. And the question is, can we go back the other way? So suppose we can solve this equation for some x and this equation for some possibly different x. Can we then solve this equation? Let's put a question mark. And the answer is, no, we can't generally go back. And it's very easy to see cases when you can't. We can just take m equals n equals 2, say, and then we can solve x squared is congruent to 3 modulo 2, and we can solve x squared is congruent to 3 modulo 2, and it looks exactly like this equation. In fact, it is exactly this equation. Since m is equal to n, we can take the same equation. But if we try and solve x squared is congruent to 3 modulo 2 times 2, we're stuck. This, the, this equation has no solutions. So we can't always go back the other way. Um, however, we can if m and n are co-prime. So you see the problem in this case is that 2 and 2 are not co-prime. 
Um, and there are um, two ways of doing this or seeing this. So there's first of all a sort of abstract method and then there's a sort of computational method. So I'll first do the abstract method which uh, what we do is we look at z modulo mnz and we map it to z modulo mz times z modulo nz. So this is a product of two sets and we're just mapping an integer a modulo mn and we're mapping it to a modulo m and a modulo n. And um, we notice that if mn is equal to 1 this is injective meaning there's at most one element of here mapping to any element there. For example suppose a maps to the element 0 0 then this means that a is congruent to 0 modulo m and it's also congruent to 0 modulo n. So a is congruent to 0 modulo mn and here we use the fact that mn are co-prime. So it's injective. On the other hand if you look at the size of these sets this set of size mn and this set of size m oops, and this set of size n so this set here is size m times n which is just mn of course. So we have an injective map between sets of the same size so it is a bijection. Um, if you want to write this in terms of ring theory we actually get an isomorphism of rings between this ring here and the product of these two rings here. Um, I'm not emphasizing abstract algebra too much but you could probably figure out what the product of two rings is and check that this is a, an isomorphism. Well there's a bit of a problem with this because suppose you've got an element of z modulo m and an element of z modulo n. How do you find the corresponding element of z modulo m n? Well there's a stupid algorithm to do this. You could just check every element of this ring here until you find one that works. But if m n say of 100 digits this is going to be ridiculously slow. Um, fortunately there's a much faster algorithm. So what I'm going to do now is to show that z modulo m z sorry m z maps to z over m z times z modulo n z is surjective. And I'm going to prove this in a way that actually gives you a fast algorithm. I mean we've shown it's surjective by this rather abstract thing. So um, what we want to do is to solve x is congruent to a modulo m and x is congruent to b modulo n. So we might choose an element a here and an element b there and we want to find an element x here which maps to a b. Well let's think what this means. This means x is equal to a plus my. It's actually equal. And this also has to be equal to b plus nz. And now if you look at this bit here we can see this is just a linear Diophantine equation and mn a 1, mn a co-prime, so we can solve fast using Euclid's algorithm. So um, the pro this proof that it's surjective looks a bit more complicated than the, than the previous proof we gave because we've got to use Euclid's algorithm, but on the other hand it gives us a, a, a fast algorithm. And now this is useful because if we want to solve f of a is congruent to 0 mod um, mn we might solve f of a is congruent to 0 mod m and f of b is congruent to 0 mod n. And then if we find an x satisfying these conditions here then we will get f of x is congruent to 0 modulo mn. So by, by using this isomorphism we can reduce 
solving an equation modulo m n to solving an equation modulo m and modulo n. Again, as usual, m and n have to be co-prime. Um, so, Uh, let's write out an example of this explicitly just to see what's going on and then do a few examples. So let's take m equals 3 and n equals 5. Um, so we're looking at z modulo 15z and let's just write out its elements. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14. And we can look at z modulo 3z. 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, and z modulo 5z. So we get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So you see that for every pair of elements here, so if we take the element 0 here and 1 here, there's a unique column containing that pair. So x equals 0 mod 3 and 1 mod 5. We look up the solution, it would be x is 6 mod 15. So let's solve, say x squared is common to x mod 15. So what we do is we break this into two problems. We solve x squared is common to x mod 3 and x squared is common to x mod 5. And then we see that x has to be congruent to 0 or 1 mod 3 and x is congruent to 0 or 1 mod 5. However, the 0 or 1 here doesn't have to be the same as the 0 or 1 there. All this says is that x must be 0 or 1 mod 3 and it must also be 0 or 1 mod 5. And if we look in this column, we see that there are four solutions to that. There are the two obvious solutions, but there are two slightly less obvious solutions. So there we find the columns where, where we get 0 or 1 in the this row and 0 or 1 in this row. And so we see that gives us x is congruent to 0, 1, 6 or 10 mod 15. Notice by the way that here we've got a quadratic equation which has four roots. So if you're used to equations of degree 2 having only two roots that um, actually fails if you're working modulo um, some numbers. We'll discuss that in more detail a bit later. Um, so, uh, another similar example, let's have the following recreational mathematics problem. Find um, a 10 digit number number x, so that x squared has the same last 10 digits. Here we're working to base 10. And, you know, um, this problem depends on working in base 10. And most problems that depend on working in base 10 are kind of a bit silly. You know, you get these problems like find a number that's the sum of the cubes of its digits or something. And most of these problems are of no mathematical interest whatsoever because as soon as you change base, the problem becomes completely different. But th this one it actually leads to some slightly interesting mathematics. So instead of making the last 10 digits the same, let's just try and make the last digit the same. Well, here we can get 6 squared equals 36. The last digit's the same. 5 squared equals 25. Well, we can cheat, of course. We can take x to be 0 or 1. So let's just say x is not equal to 0 or 1. Um, and then 76 squared is 5776. The last two digits the same. 25 squared is 625, last two digits the same. And we can go on like this. And we find, for example, that 178710937 squared is something or other 178710937. And similarly, if we take 8212890625 squared, this has the same last digits that I'm not going to bother writing out. So the problem is. How do we find these numbers? I mean, obviously trial and error is going to be a... Well, these days computers can do billions of operations a second, so trial and error is probably the fastest way to do it, but never mind. Um, anyway, if we do x squared is congruent to x 
What we want to do is to solve x squared as congruent to x modulo 10 to the 10. That just says x squared and x have the same last 10 digits. Now we notice the Chinese remainder theorem applies to this. This is the same as solving x squared is congruent to x modulo 2 to the 10 and x squared is congruent to x modulo 5 to the 10. So we've reduced it to two um, equations, each modulo a prime power. And each of these we can think of some solution. So x is congruent to 0 or 1 modulo 2 to the 10 and this has solutions x is congruent to 0 or 1 modulo 3 5 to the 10. And now we could take x0 in both of these and that would give us the uninteresting solution 0 and we could take 1 and that would give us the un uninteresting solution 1. However we can sort of take cross terms so I can take x congruent to 0 mod 5 to the 10 and 1 mod 2 to the 10 and that gives us this solution which we can work out using Euclid's algorithm if we want. Um, actually that's another way that I'll mention in a moment. Alternatively we can take these cross terms, we take x congruent to 0 mod 2 to the 10 and 1 mod 5 to the 10 and that gives us this solution here. Um, incidentally if you add these up you'll suddenly notice that you get um, something who which ends in a lot of zeros followed by 1 and that follows because if you add these up it, it would be something that's 1 modulo 10 to the 10. <coughs> anyway I mentioned there was actually a different way of finding these solutions. What you can do is you can take 5 and then you can square it and then you can square it again and each time you square 5 you get an extra digit of this solution. So we can just carry on like this and I'm going to leave it as a little exercise. Why does this work? And if you figure out why that works, I'll uh, now have another exercise. Why does it fail for if you start at 6 rather than 5? So if you start at 6, we start with 6 squared is 36 and that's not giving us something ending in 76. So you can try and figure out what the difference between 5 and 6 is which makes this thing work for just one of them. Um, so next example is going to be a historical example which is sort of why this thing is called the Chinese remainder theorem. So um, this is a problem due to a Chinese mathematician and I can't write Chinese and his name is sometimes spelt as this. And I'm not going to dare pronounce it because I've no idea what the tones are and if I if I try and pronounce it I'll probably say a bad word in Chinese and all everybody who knows Chinese will start laughing at me. So um, anyway he worked um, I mean about the third century and he had the following problem. Suppose we have a number of things. Um, if we count by three There are two left over and if we count by five there are three left over and if we count by seven there are two left over and the problem is to find out how many things there are. Well obviously this is just solving the equation x is congruent to 2 modulo 3, x is congruent to 3 modulo 5 and x is congruent to 2 modulo 7. So here instead of having two um, equations with co-prime numbers we have three equations. So what do we do? Well, well obviously we first solve these two equations. Here 3 and 5 are co-prime and if we solve these you could use Euclid's algorithm but frankly for numbers as small as this it's quickest just to, just to guess and you find this implies that x is congruent to 8 modulo 15. So next we solve x congruent to 8 modulo 15 and x is congruent to 2 modulo 7 and again we could use Euclid's algorithm but we could just cheat and guess and you find that x is now congruent to 23 modulo 7 times 15 which is 105. So the general solution of this is the number of things is 23 modulo 105.
Um, now, earlier I showed that um, there was this identity for Euler's phi function, which says that phi of mn is equal to phi of m times phi of n whenever m and n are co-prime. And you can sort of um, prove this using the Chinese remainder theorem as follows. So, so, so here we're just counting the numbers with a m n equals 1, and here we're counting the number of things with a m, a co-prime to m, and here we want a co-prime to n. Um, and if we think of mapping z modulo m n z, we, we, we think of the isomorphism between these, Um, we see that A is co-prime to M N if and only if it's co-prime to M and also co-prime to N. So what we have to do is um, we can get any A co-prime to M N by choosing something co-prime to M. So there are phi M ways of making it co-prime. And there are phi N ways of making A N equals 1. And there are phi mn ways of making a co-prime to mn. And as all these solutions just correspond to um, any pairs of these two solutions, this shows that phi of mn is equal to phi of m times phi of n. Um, um, next, I mentioned that Euler's theorem says that a to the phi of m is equal to 1 modulo m whenever a m equals 1. And I mentioned earlier that this was not actually a very good theorem. And what I'm going to do now is to, is to try and improve it. So let's find some number n with a to the n is congruent to 1 modulo m for all, for all um, a co prime to m. And we can certainly take n equal phi of m, but can, can, can we ask, are there smaller um, values of n? Greater than zero, of course. Um, well, um, suppose m can be written as a product of prime, so it's p1 to the k1 times p2 to the k2 and so on. Then we want to solve a to the n is congruent to 1 modulo p1 to the k1. A to the n is congruent to 1 modulo p2 to the k2, and so on. And let's think about this. Well, we can solve this provided phi of p1 to the k1 divides n. And we can solve this provided phi of p2 to the k2. Whoops, sorry, that's a p divides n. Um, so we want pi to the ki minus 1 times pi minus 1 divides n. So this is of course phi of pi to the ki. Um, and Euler, we, we, we just take phi of n, um, so phi of m, which is the product of these. But we don't have to take the product. We could take the least common multiple, and this would also do, and it will in general be smaller than the product. Um, well, we can do even better than this, um, because if we look at the prime 2, we know that a squared is congruent to 1 modulo 2 cubed. But Euler just says that a to the 4 is congruent to 1 modulo 2 cubed. Um, and since a squared is congruent to 1 modulo 2 cubed, this easily implies a to the 4 is congruent to 1 modulo 2 to the 4, which implies a to the 8 is congruent to 1 modulo 2 to the um, 5, and so on. And you can see this just by, by repeatedly squaring. For instance, if um, a to the 4 is, is equal to 1 plus 2 to the 4 times 
something, then a to the eight is going to be one plus two times two to the four times something plus two to the eight times something squared, which is the form one plus two to the five times something. So um, in fact, we can squeeze out an extra factor of two. We find that um, a to the two to the k minus two is congruent to one modulo two to the k whenever k is greater than or equal to three. And Euler only gives two to the k minus one instead of two to the k minus two. So we can squeeze out an extra factor when the prime is two. So let's see an example of this. Let's find a number n such that a to the n is congruent to 1 modulo, say, 27 million. Um, and we first factor this into primes. So this is equal to 2, two to the 6 times 3 cubed times 5 to the 6. And now we work out phi of all these numbers. So phi, we get 2 to the 5 here. And here we get 3 squared times 2. And here we get 5 um, to the 5 times um, times um, 4. Um, and um, now we notice that Euler states you can take n to be 2 to the 5 times 3 squared times 2 times 5 to the 5 times 4, which is phi of this number here. But instead, we can take the least common multiple of these numbers. So we're trying to take the least common multiple of 2 to the 5, 3 squared times 2 and 5 to the 5, which gives us 2 to the 5 times 3 squared times 5 to the 5. But we can do any even better. We can get an extra factor of 2. Because instead of taking 2 to the 5, um, we can instead use 2 to the 4. And then, of course, we've still got the 3 squared times 5 to the 5. So we can take n to be this number here, which is considerably smaller than the number that Euler gives. Um, now we have the problem. Um, is, is the number n we get like this the best possible? In fact, we can ask this for primes. Let's just take m equals p to be prime. Um, then we know that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. Um, and we, we ask, can we improve this? So we can ask, is this best possible? And we can ask more generally, is there a number, is there a fixed number a so that <coughs> a to the k is not equal to what, not congruent to 1 modulo p for 1 less than or equal to k is less than p minus 1. Um, if we can find a, a number like this, it will be called a primitive root. And primitive roots exist, but it's actually a bit tricky to prove they exist. Um, in fact, Euler never quite managed to do this properly. Um, so next lecture, we'll be, we'll be talking about primitive roots.